Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another segment of Condo Insider. Um, we're so happy to have you here, and we hope everybody had a really good Thanksgiving and is looking forward to the Christmas holidays. So today I have um, with me as my, um, my guest, who is also one of our Condo Insider hosts, is Richard Emery. And we're going to talk about, um, about the um, RR105C that is done by property management companies. They're provided to realtors, they're provided to lenders as well. And we're going to talk about the importance of the accuracy of that document. So um, to start off, Richard, so give us a little bit about yourself, because I've known you for a long time, but I don't know how much everybody else knows about you. Well, I've been in the uh, industry, condo industry, for um, 30 years. I used to own my own property management company, been very engaged in the community by being on the Hawaii Council Community Association Board, as well as CAI Legislative Action Committee. Um, sold my business in 2011, but still retained interest in the industry and uh, primarily do uh, consulting and expert witness work on real estate matters before uh, the condo industry and other parts of real estate as well. Okay, great. God, I've known you since I was a child. So we're going to talk about the RR105C. It's a it's a document with a lot of disclosures on it, very important disclosures that um, is used by everyone to the party of a real estate transaction. So explain to me what exactly is the RR105C. Well, let me share with you a little bit of history. Take you back to approximately 1995, and the Hawaii Association of Realtors set up a committee to form the first RR105C, which was called a Managing Agents Disclosure. And I was on that very first committee of the Hawaii Association of Realtors when the very first form was designed. The idea behind it is on real estate transactions, it's very important to provide sellers and buyers with accurate information so they can make an informed decision. And there's always been a seller's disclosure, meaning the owner of the apartment or the unit had a disclosure. But there was the issue of the common elements and all the things related to the common property run by the board of directors, that there was really no form at that time in 1995 that really addressed telling a potential buyer other factors about the common property that they were buying into. So the first RR105C was formed by the Hawaii Association of Realtors in about 1995. It's been amended several times since then. But the concept and importance of it is, is to give the buyers of a piece of real estate an honest disclosure on a whole bunch of aspects within RR105C so they're informed when they make a decide, decision to purchase the unit. Oh, great. God, that was in 1995 is when it first started. Wow. Um, so who actually completes the information and who has the legal obligation for the information that is completed in that form? Well, that's an interesting question because, you see, if you look at the condominium statute, we have certain obligations to produce financial statements and minutes and under the purchase and sale agreements, section M as in Mary, uh, those things are standard disclosures given by the um, uh, seller to the potential buyer. When you look at the RO105C itself, nowhere in the statute does it require the managing agent to complete that form. It's done on a voluntary basis for the good of the industry for the payment of a fee. What people don't seem to realize is that the RR105C is not a static document. You can pair it once and just click a copy and send it to somebody because the requirements are it has to be dated at the time of this transaction and it has to reference a specific unit. So the managing agent, because it's called a managing agent's disclosure, is the one who completes that form for a fee and uh, what they do is uh, uh, then go in, because if you look at some of the questions, it's like, is the maintenance fee increase contemplated? 
Well, they could have last night at a meeting voted to have a maintenance fee increase. So someone within the managing agent should look at these documents to make sure all the information provided is accurate. And if they don't know, there's plenty of blank spots where they can write something to disclose fully what the exact circumstances are. Because I know um, that form also covers um, like leasehold, because I've heard complaints about that not being completed correctly when it comes, oh, when it, you know, most lot of condos were leasehold way back when, but now they've been um, converted, but there's still pockets of existing leasehold. And then you have the other ones that bought the fee. So um, from a lender perspective, I know there's been some complaints that um, the property management companies didn't complete that part um, correctly, um, which kind of held up the transaction as well, um, because it has to, it's all regarding the subject property being purchased, right? Right. Well, the, 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 to expand on what you said, first of all, there are questions in the R0105C that are not finite answers. For example, the most common one is what percent is owner occupied? You know, managing agents don't traditionally keep that information. They've got to look at the database and addresses and try to come up with their best estimate of what the number is, but it's not perfect or pure. The same is true in the leasehold issue. They should be able to tell whether the apartment is leasehold or not just by because more it's more common that the association bills for the leasehold portion. They can very easily figure that out. But there are condos out there that the lessor bills the owner directly. The association is not involved in collecting the lease rent. They don't know who bought or didn't buy the fee. So it's not always an easy chore for the managing agent to give 100% reliable information. Well, that's true. That's why you have the realtor going over it that are one of see because they can tell from the preliminary title report that it's it'll say fee simple or leasehold, right? Um, and then, um, so let's talk about the money involved to get that document. So why well, does it cost, you know, that amount of money? Well, you know, realtors and, their, and buyers and sellers and their purchase and sale agreement usually check they want the documents in, in Schedule M, which is going to be the budget, the reserve study, the financials, the last three minutes, the last annual meeting minutes, RR105C, and a bunch of other documents, house rules, et cetera. Some of those are static documents and easy to produce. They don't really change that often, like the declaration of the bylaws. Not always true, but uh, some might true. But when you start then saying to the managing agent, you're going to have, because remember, all managing agents are real estate brokers under the laws in the state of Hawaii. So they have obligations and potential license issues with misrepresentation. So it's very important that, and I'm not saying all management companies do a good job at this, but uh, they need to take that R0105C and put attention to it to make sure the information is timely and accurate with regard to what they're, what, what they're telling people. And they always have, as I said, the ability and these uh, open block areas to explain something such as we don't maintain records on the lease fee interest because the relationship is directly between the lessor and the owner. And we, we have not totally reliable information. Same thing goes for owner occupancy, because I remember um, a one where the owner occupancy was incorrect. And so we actually provided the information um, to the property manager because some people use PO boxes, but they live on property, you know? So sometimes going through the addresses is always the best thing. So you kind of have to rely on the on-site people to help provide that accurate information if you can. Um, well, the bigger problem, to be honest with you, is that times have changed. In the early days, having been in this industry, me, I'm old, that the, uh, uh, you know, people would just look at what the lender had a minimum requirement of, of at least 50% owner occupied, and they would just plug the number to make sure that the person would be qualified. Well, the times have changed now, and liability has become much greater with litigation coming all over the place on all sorts of aspects of buying and selling real estate. And the R0105C and actually the, uh, the budget reserve study issues are primarily the biggest areas you see litigation now on this matter, which is litigation against the association. And um, from a lender standpoint, I know the document R0105C has a, has a time limit. So especially now after the Florida collapse, 
they're requiring it to be no later than 30 days old. You know, so it's a constant update, which I know is, you know, it's arduous for busy property managers. They got other things to do too, but but still they got to take the time to fill it out accurately. Um, so I know you've been involved in some, um, as an expert witness in some um, lawsuits. So tell me about some of the those kind of claims that come about with errors in our all one five C's. Well, I th thought about that question you were going to ask, and I have three or four examples that are all a little different. Let me begin by saying <clears throat> that more and more litigation is happening because of disclosures, and whether it be disclosures in the reserve state not being accurate, whether it be disclosures in the R105C being inaccurate. And a lot of times it's from the buyer who buys in a unit who relied on that information to make a decision to buy it. <clears throat> and I can give you, let me give you uh, the first example. <clears throat> a owner, I'm not going to mention names of projects, by the way. An owner, new owner buys in a project, gets the RO105C, and the RO105C does not include information with regard to an upcoming special assessment for seawall repair. And that would mean that hypothetically that every unit is being assessed 15, 20, 25,000 because of the need to have a seawall repair. But it's not included in the R0105C that there are even discussions about I mean, it'd be very easy to say that there are seawall issues that are being evaluated by an engineer that may result in an assessment. Uh, the information is unknown at this time. There's ways you can deal with it based on whatever the factual truth is at that moment. What happens is everybody just checks, not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge. And then a, a lawsuit gets filed and it says, well, you're at the board meeting. How can you say you, you don't have any knowledge on this matter? You know, and so... <clears throat> Uh, they, they 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 fight that issue, and so um, if they disclosed it in the beginning, they wouldn't have the litigation that they were. They this owner has been harmed because they wouldn't have paid as much money if they knew. Again, I make up the number. There's a twenty thousand dollar assessment for the seawall. So completing that R105C, whether there's litigation or not, what common elements need repair, all of those things are just critical. Uh, and that's example uh, number one. The offset to that one example, just briefly, is they also claim that the uh, seawall was not in the reserve study, which is an interesting argument because reserve studies include items with a finite life and a predictable useful life and cost where seawall doesn't have that. So it wouldn't have been in the reserve study no matter what. However, they had knowledge because of the board meetings and they're out getting bids and they're hiring engineers to fix the seawall that there was an issue with a common element property. And the fact was, yes, it didn't need to be in the reserve study. However, if it did need to be in the R105C. So with that, um, <clears throat> so our, um, some of the condos now, that have seawalls and as you said they weren't required so now are some people updating their reserves to include some of these seawalls that um you know especially with with the rising tides and everything like that um that wasn't really relevant like 15 you know 10 15 years ago but now it's becoming more important well it's interesting how i would recommend they handle that because first of all as i said if you had national standards of writing reserve studies you would not include the seawall but the standards don't preclude you from including the seawall. But why would you not want to have a disclosure in your reserve study saying, hypothetically, uh, seawalls are not normally included in a reserve study because it doesn't have a finite useful life, but this association is experiencing issues with the seawalls and has hired an engineer to help, in my made up example, uh, determine the cost to repair the seawall in the future. I mean, they could do something. So um, let's talk about errors and omissions, you know? So we know the liability is on the part of the person preparing that document, you know? And, and some, um, some managing agents 
have those documents being held by, by an outside third party. So really, who has the liability for the accuracy of the information? That's well, the managing agents and agents, they represent the association. So the association is going to get sued no matter what, and probably the managing agent. But going back to my example of the one litigation, I just want to mention two other things briefly. I had another case, for example, where a new owner bought in. It was a 100-unit condominium. Uh, the, the top floor had the two penthouses. There's four units per floor. So for 12 floors, that's 48 units. And the top floor had two units because they were double units for the penthouse. The owner bought in to that unit and found out that he was going to have a $100,000 assessment because the air conditioning had to be replaced. It had central air conditioning. And his share of that was 100000 He took that to binding arbitration. And the judge, the arbitrator, ruled against him because even though it wasn't in the reserve study, all of the board minutes for months, and if not a year, disclosed the problem with the air conditioning not working and that there was going to be an assessment and they'd hire mechanical engineers to evaluate the need. So if you're a buyer and you would see this, quote, red flag, did you not have some obligation to investigate it? You can't just come back and 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 hold it um, against them. Because the other kind of quick examples is uh, a realtor puts down that uh, the uh, floors in the unit are um, uh, wood floors, but they're not wood floors, they're engineered wood floors. And there's a difference in how you can repair an engineered wood floor. So I see litigation where they're suing and saying, I didn't know, I, didn't, I couldn't just sand my floor and fix it, that I had the replacement. And then I go into the one where the realtor and I, being an example, got sued because their argument was that the R105C said there was no asbestos. Well, the asbestos was, there was none in the common elements, but the old unit in the, that was being sold had asbestos in the ceiling. So the attorney tried to sue the managing agent saying that they had some obligation for disclosure within the unit. So you can see it's, it's not an easy thing. Everyone's going to have its own case. But I, when I teach this class on this subject and avoiding liability, I tell everybody the same thing. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. The, the more you put in and disclose the truth, you don't have to have all the answers. But you do have to tell what you know, and that's what it's all about. Okay, so um, we talked about that it has an age to it, um, the incorrect information, um, and then the um, the documents related to the purchase. So you, like you said in your in your example, the um, the issue for that one repair was covered in the meeting minutes. So it's it's buyer beware. You have to read those. Sit there for whatever time period to read those disclosures or that those that packet that's given to you because it includes the declarations, bylaws, house rules, um, your seller disclosure. It contains a lot. And then you have um, so many min months of minutes and financials in those packages. I mean, it, the, the buyer needs to sit and, and look at those and review them um, along with the realtor should help uh, actually help them if they need to. Um, any thoughts about that? Well, you know, I teach the CE class, Continue Education for Real Estate Licensees. I teach one called Condo Governance, and the other is called Understanding Condo Financial Statements. And basically, what we teach realtors are is to disclose the documents, make sure they get everything. Because uh, in the one case I was briefly mentioning, uh, where they uh, got sued, the managing agent got sued, he didn't prepare the RR-105C. They bought it from a, a company that scrubs old R-105Cs. So the person who had signed it died two years earlier. You know, and so, and so it, it, people aren't putting enough attention to this. So realtors need to be telling buyers, you need to review these documents. Number two, if you have questions, I will help you find a person who's qualified to answer it, whether it be the association's lawyer or accountant, depending on what they answer in the R-105C. But real estate licensees are not really qualified to interpret the financial statement of the association or to interpret the reserve study. So I think we're nearing uh, our time limit. So, so just to recap the importance of the RR1 LCIC, there is a time limit, it, it, it ages, 
you know, generally because now with um, a lot of new things that have come up um, for lenders, sometimes they won't take it if it's past 30 days. Um, and the property manager has to complete it with the best accuracy possible um, to the date that he um, prepared the document. Um, and they have to uh, make sure it's done correctly. Um, otherwise it could be result in some kind of legal action and they can't rely on errors and omissions for, you know, like, well, we carry errors and omissions, so, you know, we can do a mistake and, you know, it doesn't kind of doesn't work that way. Right. Um, well, errors and omissions will defend them, but if there's a claim, and 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 they're found to be uh, negligent in their ref representations, uh, and they have to pay the owner their share, let's say the twenty thousand for the seawall that they weren't advised of. That's not going to come from insurance. That's going to come from the owner's pockets, and yeah. it could come from the board if they uh, intentionally and willfully, gross negligently, deceive people by it. And the managing right. agent, who's a broker. It has all these requirements under Chapter 467 of misrepresentation. They have an actual obligation to make sure what's presented is correct. Remember, it's the managing agent's disclosure. They're signing it. So it's just the future of the world that we need to put more time and energy into making sure what we give is correct. Right. So we can't, you know, like some people say, well, I have insurance for it. And I go, well, it doesn't work that way. You can't just rely on your insurance coverage to just be to not concentrate it on, on completing it or doing it 100%, you know? So it's, you, you have to take the time out, you know, and to do it accurately and um, as best as you can. Um, so the reserve studies, you know, they go hand in hand with um, some things are getting updated that never used to be included in reserves, but now probably should be included, like the seawall you mentioned, um, or anything else that could be a longer life um, I think some boards need to think about some things that were never included or didn't have to be included in the reserves, but they might want to now consider putting it into their reserves, um, like the seawalls. Well, I see a lot of manipulation on reserve studies because they don't want to raise maintenance fees. And they, want, they don't want to address the true costs of maintaining the building. When Act 62 was signed into law last year, it was mandated that if you do your own reserve study, that is, you're not using a professional reserve preparer, you have an obligation not less than every three years to have your internal reserve study reviewed by a professional, which throws out an interesting argument because I, as you may not know, I wrote the original reserve amendments in 1997. I have the highest certifications in the country. And so if someone comes to me and says, we want you to re review your reserve study, those are interesting questions. Well, how can I re re review a reserve study if I haven't visited the project? How can I review a reserve study? What if I review it and say, your roof estimate is way off. It's going to fail sooner than later. You gave it a 20-year life. It's not reasonable. Well, what happens? The board says, well, thank you for your opinion. Uh, we, we have the professional opinion, but we're still going to vote to keep the reserve study the way it is. So uh, I know the industry uh, that I'm a part of, the CAI slash HCCA, we're looking at putting more granular information in 514B148 on reserve obligations and budget obligations on disclosure and things they have to do because we can't with you. Too many people cheat. I would tell you there's going to be huge problems down the road with the association because they haven't funded their reserves. So with that new law that went into effect, so it has to be done by an outside third party. So, um, and you know, a lot of AOs, they were being done by their managing agents. So now that no longer qualifies, right? They have to go outside that box. Is that true? Yes and, yes and no. Some managing agents have a reserve department with a certified, fully certified people. Right, if they so have that. Yeah, and so they're using a reserve professional that's certified and who would know the building better but the managing agent theory? Well, the ones who aren't using any kind of independent, because uh, if you look at the national standards, even though it's owned by the management company, that reserve jurisdiction, they still have to comply with the national standards of independence and the rest of it. But right. the ones who aren't doing that or doing it themselves or having a management company put it together on Excel spreadsheet are going to have to go get an independent analysis. And what are they going to do if the independent analysis says it's incorrect. Incorrect, meaning the one that they've been using all along is incorrect or? 
or um because that's what i'm kind of like thinking that's going to be hitting some people is they've been oh. using an in-house that does not have an in-house reserve specialist they've been using you know their own property manager excel spreadsheet style and then now when they get an independent outside independent they're going to be into a, an eye-opening experience well, maybe a, a, another show for another day, but the three major things on reserve studies that I see where people make a mistake, you begin with a beginning balance and do this forecast. Why well, have people who start their beginning balance at two and a half million when the truth is they only have one million in the bank? So how how reliable is that forecast of future funds right. if you intentionally knock a million and a half dollars or put a million and a half dollars in that doesn't exist? The second thing is what they do is they um, kick the can down the road and put long, useful lives on these things. And then the third thing they do is that they will show an increase to reserve contributions every year of 10, 15, 20%. They never end up doing it, but it gets them by this year by making it look like the cash flow plan meets the law. And so there's, there's too much fooling around with the reserve study. It's a... Uh, it's a fact of life in a condominium. You need to reserve it properly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are um, near, and we're actually near our time. Um, any useful thoughts you want to recap, Richard? No, I would just go back to the D word: disclosure. You mm -hmm. need to put time in it, look at it, and disclose it accurately. Otherwise, I can assure you, you expose yourself to risk in the future of litigation and other problems. I'm going to add in the word read disclosures and read them. Be careful you read them carefully um, so that you can spot anything that sounds out of the ordinary. Um, so, Richard, I really want to thank you for being on the show with me today to talk about this um, this um, RR105C uh, and the importance of it, because I know a lot of people don't really understand the, the real big importance of that document. Um, uh, and um, I really want to thank you for going over it and, and the history of it. I never knew some of that stuff. Um, and um, I hope you and your wife have a really nice Christmas. Yeah, happy holidays to everyone. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. We'll see you again next week on another Condo Insider segment. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.